there's many things to consider when we uh, think about the future of food. We can talk about market trends. What's the next macaron? When are they going to stop talking about bacon? I mean, I get it. Bacon is wonderful. <laughs> but whilst these issues might be important to you or I, they're probably less significant to us. And when I say us, I mean the global us, the global we. And when I tell people that I work in food, they say, well, that's great, everyone's got to eat. And whilst it's true that everyone has to eat, not everyone gets to. What are we going to do about food? This is a question that we've been asking for over 200 years, but I would argue that we've never had a toolbox of solutions this big to deal with the challenges that we face. Given the theme of today, which is futures, I feel it's appropriate to talk about food because food is important. When I first started studying gastronomy some years ago, I wrote a thesis on the acceptance of new foods and it was heavily intertwined with the future of food and I came across an author, Warren Belasco, who wrote a book called Meals to Come, The History of the Future of Food and he identified a number of authors, um, a number of thinkers who tried to answer the question of how to feed a growing population. One of these was Robert Malthus who in 1798 spoke about the growth of the population which he described as exponential and the growth of the food supply, which he described as arithmetic or linear in nature. And he said this would lead to a mismatch between the food supply and the population and a shortage of food. Now, his solution was population control. But this was countered in 1820 by William Godwin, who said that people are the means of production and that therefore any increase in the population would lead to an increase in our ability to produce food. Now, what he probably didn't take into account was um, at this time, the world population was around a billion people, so he probably didn't take into account uh, the entire capacity of the earth for producing food. Um, and the third author, and probably my favourite, was the Marquis de Condorcet, and he spoke about the indefinite perfectibility of man. Now, if he'd met my wife, he might have worded it a little bit differently, but... He also spoke about how, with the proper encouragement of the agricultural arts, we would be able to produce a very large amount of food on a very small amount of land, and that if any limits were reached, we could just produce animal and vegetable products um, artificially. And it turns out he wasn't too far from the truth, because if we fast forward 150 years to the 1960s, the world population was 2.3 billion, and we were asking how we're going to feed the 5 billion people that are going to be on Earth by the year 2000. Well, we now know there were 6 billion people at this time, but let's not split hairs over a billion people. Um, but there was a huge amount of encouragement of the agricultural arts, so much so that it's thought that over a billion people were brought out of starvation. Now, this was done through the um, increase in crop yields, predominantly through uh, the hybridisation of cereal crops, the modernisation of farming methods, and um, the use of chemical um, fertilisers. And this era was known as the Green Revolution. Uh, its father, Norman Borlaug, was awarded the 1970 Nobel Peace Prize for his contributions to agricultural science and uh, for increasing the global food supply. So if we fast forward another 50 years to the present, where do we stand now? Well, according to the United Nations, we're going to have 9 billion people on Earth by the year 2050, and just under 11 billion by 2100. And under the current regime, under the current model, we're going to have to increase the food supply by around 70% in order to cope with this. It's also challenges to our climate. According to an Australian government website, um, average temperatures in Australia are going to increase by two to two and a half degrees. Um, one study's predicted that we will lose our ability to produce food by around 18% due to these challenges to our climate. We're also seeing changes in um, wealth. In developing countries, there's an emerging middle class and they want more and better quality food, and in particular, they want protein. And this is going to place unique demands on our food supply. There's also a mismatch between who gets and who doesn't. Um, and it's causing health problems in the developed world. Heart disease, diabetes, hypertension and stroke are amongst our biggest health problems. And they're all related in some way to the overconsumption of food. Yet in developing countries, 
Over 800 million people go hungry every day due to malnutrition. We can see that the, these questions that we asked some 200 years ago aren't too dissimilar from the challenges that we're facing today. They're a little more specific, but we've also never had so many potential solutions. I'm just, I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm just going to outline a few uh, of the initiatives that we're looking at. Now, food waste is a big problem, but it also represents one of our biggest opportunities. According to the Food and Agriculture um, Organisation of the United Nations, we waste approximately 32% of all the food that we produce. Now, this is food that is fit for consumption. It's healthy food. And in Australia, according to FoodWise, the average Australian household wastes approximately 20% 20, uh, 20 um, of all the food that it buys. Uh, that's $1,000 a year per household or 345 kilos of food per year per household. And collectively, the average, the, collectively in Australia, uh, we waste um, 4 million tonnes of food at the household level. So for the, for the household, the message is clear. And to borrow from an old World War II conservation motto, um, eat all you want, but eat all you take. There are even apps which can help us get rid of waste. Leftover Swap is an app that connects people locally with um, those who have leftover food with those that want them. You might find someone around the corner who's got some cake or hot dogs or pizza or who knows what. They don't want the rest of it. If you want it, you can, you can grab it. Um, but also at the food industry level, uh, there's significant food waste in the form of rejected produce. And now, uh, there's a lot of produce that's rejected either due to visual flaws, odd shapes, odd sizes. Um, and a number of retailers have started to pick up on this. Uh, one in particular is Woolworths, and they've started selling some of this rejected produce under its odd bunch category. And it markets itself as food that's tasted, not wasted. Um, and at the food production level, there's also waste that comes as a result of either overproduction or um, food that doesn't meet its delivery schedules. Um, and organisations here in Australia, such as Oz Harvest, are seeking to redistribute some of this food locally to those that are in need. Now, when we think of all of the food waste in Australia in terms of calories, uh, according to the World Resources Institute, for North America and Oceania, so that includes Australia, we waste on average, or we throw away, approximately 1,500 calories of food per day. Um, now, with, an, with a population in Australia of around 23.5 million people, and the assumption that we can adequately survive on 2,000 calories a day, we're throwing away enough food to feed just under 18 million people. There's other stuff going on around the world. Um, there's an organisation in France, Disco Boco, and they're producing jams and pickles and chutneys in a community environment from some of this uh, rejected produce. And in the UK, in Leeds, there's the real junk food project Pay As You Feel Cafe, and they're making healthy meals out of uh, rejected food stock um, to help with food waste. But it's not just in... Um, developed countries that we've got waste. Develop, developing countries have their issues too. Um, and through investment and education and improvement in um, farming methods and efficiencies um, and infrastructure, things such as roads and cold chain logistics, we'll be able to help to keep food better, uh, in a better condition for longer and reduce the rate of food spoilage, which is the main issue um, in these countries. There's also been huge increases uh, in or improvements in the way that we communicate. And we're able to communicate over distances we've not been able to do before. Um, I'm sure someone in the room has, you know, you know I've been reading my Twitter tweet, uh, Twitter feed, and people have already, you know, been taking pictures and putting messages up onto social media, and they've been seen across the world. It's not even that novel anymore, but the use of things like... Um, Temperature probes and shipping containers, RFID tags and food packets, and climate sensors on farming land are networking our food supply, and they're enabling us to monitor it in real time. And we'll be able to look at a wide range of things, such as um, farming conditions, um, and uh, monitor this food supply all the way from primary production through processing, right through the cold chain, right to the end consumer. 
And this will help to prevent food spoilage, um, as well as to help reduce food waste um, and improve uh, food safety. And the, this kind of leads me on to the next thing, which is what do we do with all of this data that we're collecting? There's been massive increases in computational power in recent years that um, have led to the relatively recent buzzword of big data. Now, for the food industry, big data is going to give us incredible opportunities to analyse very large data sets in ways that we've either been unable to do before or that are very difficult. Um, and we'll be able to build predictive models based on large numbers of complex variables. Uh, which will help us to do a, a range of things, such as determine uh, the best crops for certain soil types, uh, changes in rainfall levels, um, signs of pests and drought uh, and diseases, and even anticipated prices in local markets. And when we think of the idea of uh, more people and less food, we assume that the answer is just to keep producing in the, way, in the manner in that we're doing it at the moment. But the answer is a little more complex than this. And big data will enable us to optimise our efforts so that instead of just producing more, we produce more of the right things in the right places for different groups of people with different types of needs. We're also, um, I mentioned earlier that we're going to have to increase the food supply under the current model by 70% to deal with the increase in population. And it's been estimated that agricultural productivity is going to have to increase by 25% in order to um, help us do this. And one thing that the world is looking at is robot farming. Now, robots um, are going to play a major role in uh, fully, fully automating the majority of agricultural tasks, all the way from um, grafting to planting, um, harvesting, sorting, packaging and boxing. They're now even using drones to determine where crops need spraying, and some of the drones are able to do the spraying themselves. We're also seeing a huge number of um, new foods as well. There was the, there was the um, TED talk about high-protein muffins made of cricket flour, but there's other, there's other high-protein foods out there, new ones. Corn is one, which is... Uh, come from the UK, but they're also, it's also being sold here in Australia, um, which is a meat analogue product, it's a faux meat product, and it owes its ca meaty characteristics primarily to a fungus. Now, when it's mixed with um, other conventional ingredients and processed using conventional processing methods, they are able to adequately make uh, food products that taste like beef, chicken, pork, and some of them are quite convincing, some of them are a little bit less so, but some of them are very good. Uh, they're high in protein and they're low in saturated fats. And they're not the only company doing these things. Beyond Meat is a company in the US uh, which is making chicken and beef protein, uh, chicken and beef analogues, um, predominantly out of uh, soy and pea protein isolates. And they're gaining traction in the US markets. Um, and they, uh, they're also gaining significant venture capital. And whilst it's you know, it's, it's true that meat is probably going to play um, an important role in our future food supply, or at least for the time being. Products that, such as these are going to help us to shore up any potential, fu potential future protein shortages. Now, these are just a few ideas. Um, I haven't spoken about uh, seafood or aquaculture. I haven't spoken about the water supply. I haven't spoken about um, the tremendous opportunities that exist for things like seaweed. Um, or even urban farming. But I hope I've shown you today that in many ways the questions that we were asking in the past are still related to the challenges that we face today. And perhaps some of these original thinkers were right in that people are the means of production, but not necessarily just in terms of labour, but in terms of knowledge and solutions. And there's I'd also like to think we've seen that there's been a tremendous amount of encouragement of the agricultural arts, but more is needed. We've got a myriad of tools at our disposal to help us meet the challenges that we face in the future. And it's important that we use all of them to ensure the robustness and the validity of our food supply for the long term and not just for quarterly gains. Our food and water supply need to be seen as a strategic asset and not treated as a commodity. Because the future that we will have will be dependent on the way that we address these challenges now, 
Otherwise, the future will decide its outcome for us, whether we like it or not. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that food is important, and I hope you do too. Thank you.